Welcome back. This week, Israel held elections, and the results have been confusing to people around the world, and I guess at home as well. Uh, it seems that Zippy Livni's Kadima party did win the most seats, but that Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party is again said to be most likely to be able to form a coalition government. So who will be Israel's next prime minister, and what will that mean for Israel and for the peace process? Well, I'm joined now, I'm delighted to say, from Tel Aviv by Dan Gilliman, who was until very recently Israel's ambassador to the UN. Dan, welcome. Who is going to be the next prime minister? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. And it's an honor to be on your program. Good afternoon. Uh, that's probably one of the toughest questions uh, one can ask today, <laughs> because the Israeli political scene as made evident just now by the recent election is indeed very confusing and very unclear. Uh, just to put things in perspective, and you are seeing all over the world screens today as someone who interviewed a notorious, famous American president, you know very much about American politics. The U.S. has just elected its 44th president in 238 years. We have just gone to elections for the 32nd time in 60 years. And I think that says a lot about the uncertainty and instability of our political system. What we have at the moment, as you rightly pointed out, is a party led by Tsipi Livni, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, which got the mo largest number of seats. But on the other hand, we have a right-wing bloc which is led by Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, several other parties who have the numbers, which is over 60 members of parliament out of 120, uh, to actually form a government. The question is really, what will Netanyahu choose? I truly believe that he is not interested in heading a narrow right-wing coalition. It will be a paralyzed government. It will be a government which will not enable him to do what he really wants to do, neither on the peace process nor on the economy. So I think his real aim would be to form a wide national unity government in which uh, Tsipi Livni and the Kadima party will be partners, and maybe even uh, Labour, although it lost very badly in the elections. But uh, I think that Netanyahu may very well want to see Ehud Barak continue as defense minister. So my dream scenario would be a wide national unity government comprised of the four largest party parties in Israel, uh, which will be there for the next four years because we are facing enormous challenges, some of them existential to the state of Israel security-wise, very big challenges in the economy as the rest of the world is facing. We cannot afford another episode, another government of uh, 12 or 18 months, which will spend most time on survival and political haggling, blackmail and bribery. I think we need a stable government which will be there for four years. And I think the first thing that government must do and should do is change the electoral system in Israel so that next time we go to elections and assure that we have a majority that can really run the country. That's, I think, absolutely crucial, looking at the problems that proportional representation have caused uh, in Israel and indeed in New Zealand. Um, but in terms of the grand coalition, as it were, there that you mentioned, would Zippy Livni be prepared, having apparently won the election, to play second fiddle to Netanyahu? that Because I'm sure you're saying Netanyahu would be prime minister. Zippy Lidney, he'd want as foreign minister? Well, first of all, at the moment, I know that uh, Zippy is still trying uh, to form a government uh, based on what she feels is the moral right she got and the mandate from the people to form such a government by getting the largest number of seats. Uh, the decision ultimately will be up to uh, President uh, Paris. I, I believe that uh, Tsipi is a true Israeli patriot. I think she will do anything to be prime minister. She'll do everything she can to form a government. But if she realizes she can't, I think she will feel the responsibility and the duty upon her to join a government in order to assure that Israel can indeed deal with the enormous problems it's facing. So I think, if you ask me, uh, the main character in this uh, drama that's unfolding in front of our eyes in Israel today, 
are in a way neither Bibi Netanyahu nor Tsipi Livni nor Yvette Lieberman but Shimon Peres. I think he has a great responsibility and he may surprise everybody by going beyond what the law provides him with. But if Mr. Lieberman went with, in fact, as be a surprise to some, went with Kadima, with Zippy Livni, rather than with the more right-wing Benjamin Netanyahu, um, in that situation, there's no way you think that she can, she can get more than 60, even with, even with their support, with, with Israel Better News support. Uh, you know, it's very, very difficult. I mean, I, Israeli politics is another area where I would say never say never. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's a matter of price. Sometimes it's a matter of pol political expediency or convenience. Uh, I think under certain circumstances, I mean, she could, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't see, if they go on a civilian agenda, and there are certain things which both she and uh, Israel Beiteno and Avigdor Lieberman agree on, including the changing of the electoral system. If they make that their main platform, I think she may be able to. Another idea, by the way, uh, uh, Sir David, which is being floated around, is an idea we tried once before with uh, Itzhak Shamir and Shimon Peres, and that is the idea of rotation. Because of the problems, uh, there may be a point at which the parties or the president will decide that uh, one should go first for the first two years and the other for the next two years. Now, that is something which at the moment both Bibi Netanyahu and Tsipi Livni are vehemently uh, denying, but we've seen stranger things happen in Israel and in Israeli politics, and I wouldn't rule that out altogether either. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. That's, that's all now incredibly clear, thank uh, or it's incredibly clear how unclear it is, and uh, we thank you so much for joining us. Thank right. you. For years, architect Zaha Hadid received praise for her groundbreaking designs, but critics dismissed her work as unbuildable. Now Zaha is the most famous female architect in the world and is sought after everywhere with more than 50 projects, from Dubai to China, from Istanbul to Moscow. In 2004, Zaha Hadid became the first woman to win the Pritzker Art Architecture Prize, the equivalent to the Nobel Prize in Architecture. Uh, she joins me now. Welcome, Zaha. What was the magic moment when you moved into your first big job where the thing was actually built after people saying you, your buildings were wonderful but they didn't get built? When did that all change? Uh, well, it changed in 93 when we opened the uh, the Prague for Vitra Fire, the Vitra Fire Station in Valam Rhine, which is near Switzerland, on the border of Switzerland and Germany. Uh, that was, a, of course, a major breakthrough. Uh, but because it was done for a private client, people did not think, you know, maybe it's not necessarily a generic project. It was a special project for, for a particular client. And, but I think that kind of eased the way into the next the next thing. That was, that's, you moved so on. I think that Vitra was seminal, and then later, uh, maybe in 97, 98, a um, few years later, when we won the competition for the Cincinnati Art Center, and a year later, Rome, and I think then it was a, that was, we won competition. That was the breakthrough, and from then on. Yeah. Because yeah. no. uh, it's an unusual task, obviously, to be an architect, and choice of career. A lot of people would like to do it, but very few people do do it. Um, when did you know you were going to be an architect? Well, I didn't know I was going to become one, but I, I was interested in it since I was a kid. I was maybe 10, 11 years old when I, I thought there was something I would like to do. That age? Uh, that age, and I'm not sure exactly what kind of triggered it off. Um, but was, was there a building you saw? Or? Well, I used to travel. We used to come to Europe every summer. From, uh, and from Iraq. From Iraq. Right. And, um, I, you know, the 60s was an interesting time in terms of also being in the Arab world and kind of uh, nation building. And, and um, so I think that there was, an, and there was a, a general interest in architecture worldwide. Uh, you know, Chicago was being, many of the new skyscrapers being built, Brazil. So I think that there was always, like, you know, Life magazine at home and Time Life and and I think that that interests me. But I think there was a lot of interest also 
and building and in the in the Arab world, you know, if you think of Lebanon and, and Iraq and various areas in the Gulf. Um, so there was an, a general, I think, a moment of hope, the 60s, uh, even yeah, towards the late 60s. So I, I actually, that's what I really, and I think I s must have seen an exhibit in Baghdad, uh, you know, uh, which maybe triggered this off. Well, let's take an example. Um, my, of the, all the pictures of your of your buildings that I've seen, the design for the Dubai Towers and so on excited me the most. There, there, there it is. Yeah. Spectacular, and the closer you get, the more spectacular it looks. Um, now, how did that come about? How did you get the idea for that? What was the germ that's got you going? Well, well, I think that you know, first of all, we have been trying to work on kind of um, fluid, a fluid language. Uh, for, for, for architecture, for buildings, uh, and to achieve the ultimate fluid space. And, you know, and with towers, it's usually quite, you know, the floors are quite repetitive, except one looks at kind of New York towers in the, in the 30s. And the idea of this was to kind of really make, make a cluster of towers, three towers, but they're not separated, they are connected. The other thing which we get, we'll also look at and how the tower meets the ground. These are enormous buildings. And how do they meet the ground? How that? Yes, you know, and, and I mean the thing is that also towers tend to go up in a linear fashion, yeah. vertically, yeah, and this I mean, this is different. Well, this kind of leads because what happens is that two the towers share their cores, so the core, which is the elevators and all the services, operate as a partly structure, and partly core. So the the towers kind of share their core, and then one of them leans. Uh, towards the other. Right, right, right. And you said once, buildings should keep you dry and feed the soul. So those are two things that they've got to do, well, I mean, practical and, and spiritual. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, ultimately, if the basic thing about architecture is shelter. You know, it's, in the, it's the most basic form. And, and, um, but then you have to also create a, you know, a special experience. It could be very modest you know, for those who use it, you know. Uh, and I think there is, of course, tremendous uh, space for invention in terms of civic and public buildings. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, these are allow everybody to see them because they're cultural projects. Because, you know, I, don't, I feel that not everybody in the world is privileged always to travel and see everything around the globe and experience that, and I think that it is important that within your locale or adjacent to where you are, there are some great projects. Well, there's some great projects there, and with all the ones that you're developing as, as well at the moment, and uh, let's hope that the world is a peaceful world and none, yes, of, them, so none of them get destroyed no, no, along the way. Not, yeah, no. Well, our thanks to Zaha, and our thanks to all of our guests once again. Do join us again in seven days' time for another sparkling frost over the world.